Um, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at pain and pain assessment. Um, and I want you to think about what we actually mean by pain. All right, so this is something which is quite a complex thing. Um, there is a campaign out, uh, which is that pain is the fifth vital sign. Okay, have you heard of that campaign? No? It's, prom it's promoted by the Royal College of Nursing, by the British Pain Society, by the International Association for the Study of Pain. And what they're trying to make nurses think about is when they're taking other measurements, physical measurements from patients, they also ask them about their pain. But there is a problem with, with this campaign because of the nature of pain itself. So when I say pain is the fifth vital sign, what do I mean by the other four vital signs? Breathing, okay, yes, respiratory rate. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Well, what in particular am I measuring? Uh, pulse, blood pressure, temperature. and temperature. Okay, so I want you to think about those four vital signs. All right? They're very important measures, and they're what we call objective measures. By an objective measure, it means that there is a process to go through with getting that measure, which as long as the people who are taking the measure follow the process correctly, uh, somebody else could come along and get the same result. Yeah, would you agree? So if we're looking at respiratory rate, how do we record respiratory rate? Okay, so you're looking at people's breathing, and what do you do? Count you count them. <coughs> how long? Over? A minute. A minute. For a minute. So you count how many breaths in or out that somebody takes over a minute. Yeah? And, you know, that's a recording that you can do, and somebody else who's recording it at the same time should get the same measurement as you. Would you agree? So it's independent of the person who has been tested. Yeah? If it's done properly, it's objective, okay? the person who's doing the recording on the subject, the person who's breathing, should get the same result at the same time as somebody else is recording it. Yeah? Would you agree? That's what we mean by an objective measure. So if we look at pulse, what is pulse measuring? Heart rate. Now, okay, it's measuring heart rate where? Is it measuring the actual heart itself? Okay, it's measuring the heart rate in a distant point. Yeah, it's measuring the, the blood flow through an artery at some point. Usually it's the radial, but it can be um, jugular, it can be femoral. Yeah? So, there are several places you can take a heart rate recording. Okay. And if, if you can, with some physiological problems, get a different heart rate from a pulse in the right hand and the left hand. There might be some condition that somebody has that causes that. Okay. But, what, you, what are you measuring with pulse rate? Is it how fast the blood transports around the body? Okay. You're me well, you're measuring what? Hmm? What do we mean by heartbeat? The contraction of the heart. Yeah. So you're measuring the contraction of the heart at that at that point, and you're measuring it over a minute. Yeah. Or well, you should do not over 15 minutes and multiply it by four, because that creates a, a, an error risk. Okay. So you measure over the full minute. Okay. So you're measuring that in that point each time the heart contracts. And you're not actually getting data on number, you're also getting data on other things as well, like how strong it is. Yeah? How, you know, if it's a bounding pulse rate, it could give you an indication that somebody's got hypertension. If it's a thready pulse rate, it could give you an indication that somebody's got shock. Yeah? When you're taking pulses, you, you get these different recordings. Okay? So, what are we measuring with blood pressure? 
Systolic and diastolic measures. Okay, so you mentioned the systolic and diastolic measures, which are what? Is it the amounts of pressure that are exerted on the, the uh, arteries? Yes. The smallest and the yeah. largest. But you're also, you're not measuring it at the heart. Again, you're measuring it at a distal point. Yeah? But, now, now there can be more operator error with blood pressure, okay, because you're using a device to measure it, not your fingers, okay, uh, not your eyesight. So you're, mo you're using a device. There could be something wrong with the device. The device could not be calibra calibrated properly. There could be something wrong with the cuff that you're using. You're using the wrong size cuff for that person. Yeah? There could be something wrong with your hearing if you're, if you're using it using a stethoscope. Yeah? Um, so there are operator errors, there are mechanical errors that could, that could creep in. All right? But if all of those are controlled and you're doing it correctly, and you are learning how to do it correctly, aren't you? You've, you've got a skills thing. You've, have you done the skills thing on yeah. taking blood pressure? Sorry. So you should all know how to do it correctly. You should all get the same recording or if you take blood pressure on a patient at the same time. Yeah? So that's, what, again, what we call an objective measure. <coughs> okay, and now, what about temperature? How do you record temperature? Well, I was a student nurse, there were two main ways to record temperature. So I'm talking, I'm going back now, before a lot of you were born, to 1984. That's when I was a student nurse. All right. We had two ways of measuring temperature then. Okay. We used a, one particular device. All right. Do you know what that device was? Hmm? It was a glass mercury thermometer. You have to be very careful. You had a silver tip and a blue tip. The silver tip was for oral measurements and the blue tip was for rectal measurements. You didn't want to get them mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, we used to measure people's rectal temperature. Okay. You still might need to do that if you're in an emergency situation, for example, or you're in the theatre and you're worried about a patient being hypothermic. You might want to measure core temperature, and rectal route is a good way of doing that. But there's another good route for measuring core temperature, which we now use, which is what? Tympanic. Yeah. Okay. So tympanic can be a problem because somebody could have a lot of earwax. Yeah. And then you're not going to get an accurate recording. Right. So we have different devices. So there's if there might, and you will get a different measure using different devices. So an oral temperature, or a skin temperature, because sometimes you know, particularly with children, you, they use these um, forehead strips, will be colder than a tympanic or a rectal one, because they're closer to the core. All right. But as long as you use the same measuring device, you will get a similar recording as long as you leave it in appropriately for long enough. Okay? And the other route we actually used to use was axilla, which you might use with some children nowadays. Yeah, we used to use axilla route on, on children and on people who wouldn't cooperate. Um, yeah. And then that, was a, that would be a lot colder because it's actually outside the body. Right? But they are all what we call objective measures because you do the same thing again and again. What about pain? Is there an objective way to measure pain? Okay. There, is a, there is the orthopedic surgeon's way of measuring pain, which if you've anybody here ever had a broken limb and have seen a, a casualty doctor or an orthopedic surgeon, you know, and what they usually do is they grab your arm and move it around and, oh, you've got pain of you. That's their way of doing it. All right? Not the most appropriate way. Okay? But we think about what is pain? Is there an objective way of measuring somebody's pain? Yeah? Okay, so you're somebody's talking about scale, which we'll get to in a minute. All right? But there is not an objective way to measure somebody's pain because although pain is a physiological experience, it's also a social and a psychological experience. Okay? So this is the problem with saying pain is the fifth vital sign. Right. It's done to make nurses check whether somebody's got pain or not. Okay? But the problem is, all of a sudden, nurses have to trust the patient. They can't rely upon their own judgment. Okay? Because when you look at the research, time and time again, 
Nurses' judgments of people's pain is wrong. Nurses are actually one of the poorest groups of people to objectively measure somebody's pain. Okay? The, the other group that's, that's worse or as bad are parents of children. That's, I only know that because they're the, the only people that, that anybody's ever done any research on. Okay? So that might just be as bad as the whole population. But nurses have had research done on them and parents have had research done on them and they've looked at the patient's self-reports and compared that to the nurse's observations based on their experience and what they see in front of them and there is hardly ever a direct correlation between the two. There's usually a big discrepancy. Okay? And this is because with pain we have to rely upon self-report. Okay? So, this is the problem we have, which is, what is pain? How can we define pain? How can we describe pain so that others can understand what our pain that we're feeling really feels like? And how can the complexity of something which is clearly very personal be um, explained to others so that they can help us? Right. This is the problem we have in pain management. This is the problem we have with pain assessment. And the problem that patients have is they have to explain this to nurses who the research has demonstrated are not good at identifying pain in people. Okay. So, we have a problem. We don't have a problem with nurses who identify that somebody's in pain because usually when that is done, the actions that are done are appropriate. So the barrier to pain management is that assessment. Okay, this is the big problem. All right? So we have to think about what is pain. Okay? And lots of people have spent a lot of time and a lot of years researching this area. Okay? If I was to ask each one of you to come up with a definition of what pain was to you, uh, we might get some similar areas, but we also might get some very different things. Okay? So what I want you to do right now, okay, is document the worst pain that you have ever had. Alright? I want you to write down, okay, the worst pain that you have ever had. Go right back to when you can remember anything. So it could be when you were a young child. It could be this very moment in time. <laughs> Alright? So I want you to document the worst pain you've ever experienced. Okay? I want you to think, when you're doing this, I want you to think about, because I can hear you talking to each other about it. It's all being recorded. Um, I also want you to think about how you would tell somebody else about that. Okay? But at the same time, I want you to think about your last experience of pain. So what's your worst and what's your latest experience of pain? Okay, And that might be you are in pain at this very moment in time. Okay? So what you should have in front of you, most of you should have two different accounts, your worst and your latest. One or two of you might have one because now is your worst experience. Who knows? That could always happen to people. All right? Okay, in which case you're very brave being here. All right? So... <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was you expressing your pain then. <laughs> okay? So, we're going to come back to those. So you've got those. I want you to think of those in the back of your mind. And while we're doing this, I want you to think about how you would tell somebody a story about those pains based upon the idea that pain is a biopsychosocial concept. Okay? Even when you get taught physiology, 
you have to remember that all the physiology that you got, got, get taught has got a psychosocial component as well. Okay? But what we have to think about, what are the physical aspects of our pain? All right? The first one we have to think of is a biological element. Now, most of us in this room will feel pain exactly the same as everybody else in terms of a physical aspect. Because we're all humans. All right? Physiologically, we're not that different. Some of us have got the advantage of having a different chromosome to some, some others. Okay? I'm not being sexist in this. So you might feel that having two X chromosomes is better than having an X and a Y. <laughs> okay? You're wrong, but never mind. <laughs> All right? Okay? So, there is a big... If you stick to those chromosomes, there's a big gender difference between women and men because women can't experience the pain of having, you know, your genitalia kicked. <laughs> All right? Or damaged. So it's excruciating pain. All right? You have to think about this. Men experience a severe pain that women never can. <laughs> all right? Now, I know that some women go on about childbirth, but we'll just gloss <laughs> over that, all right? Okay? So there are gender differences, all right? There are age differences, because as you get older, you have more experiences of pain. All right? Just from the fact that you're hanging around on this planet for long enough, you are going to have more experience of, of pain at the age of 50 than you are at the age of 20. Yeah? It stands to reason, doesn't it? Okay? Um, and so as you get older, you have more experience of pain. Now, that doesn't mean that a 50-year-old would have experienced as much pain as a 20-year-old. You can't make comparisons across people like that, but you can make comparisons within an individual. Because a 20-year-old might have been born with a condition which has left them with a lot of pain. So they might have had 20 years of life with pain, and a 50-year-old's worst experience of pain might be a, an ingrowing toenail. Yeah? Okay? So we can't make comparisons between people. That is a mistake that people make, but we can't. All right? So we have to think about people's individual history. And this is why I'm telling you that even when we focus on the biological, there is that social and psychological domain of their experience to, to bear in mind. Okay? We have to think about the state of the nervous system. Most people, your nervous system is working fine. Um, I can see some of you already starting to employ your nervous system in a way which detects and prevents pain. Because, of course, these chairs are lovely and comfortable, aren't they? Mm -hmm. All right? Um, they're well padded, and you don't need to shift your bum around to stop yourself getting a pressure sore. Mm -hmm. right? Now, normally you don't realise that you're doing this all the time. When you sit on a chair, you don't sit still. You have to move around all the time. Your nervous system is, is detecting potential damage. We call this noxious impulses. It's detecting when parts of your tissue and your bum are being squeezed and producing locally ischemic effects, which, are, which are, if aren't relieved by moving, will cause a pressure sore. This is how pressure sores develop people lose some of that ability to move or um, they lose that ability to detect it and make themselves move. There is actually a very rare genetic condition called congenital insensitivity uh, to pain um, or to the sensation of pain called CISP um, where children are born with the inability to have that experience and therefore they don't move. So they get pressure ulcers which get affected and usually die of septicemia while, while they're still babies. Right. It's very rare, okay, but that has, has been documented. Okay. So it's a very important part of your nervous system working normally. Okay. So most people, their nervous system is functioning normally. Um, the idea is you detect not just stimulation, it goes to the brain and you know, your body adapts to it okay, and responds appropriately. In some people, the nervous system is damaged and you don't have what we call normal or nociceptive pain. You have neuropathic pain. This is pain which arises from the nervous system, not in the periphery. But because of the way the body is wired, somebody might experience their pain as being in the periphery. 
Okay. So an example of this would be phantom limb pain. People with phantom limb pain might complain of, say, a painful toe in the foot that's been amputated. And that foot is clearly not there. The pain is actually experienced higher up in the nervous system. But it's the, the model the brain has of, the per, of your body is that you should have a foot there. Okay? Same thing happens when people have had a mastectomy. You can get phantom nipple pain in the nipple that's been removed. Okay? So these are what we call neuropathic pains. All right? So that's presence of tissue damage. Okay? Could cause you to have pain. Other example of that might be if you've got osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is not a neuropathic pain, it's a nociceptive pain because there is damage that's been detected by your normal nervous system. Okay? But it's been reported as being pain. Okay? Now, people used to think that this physiological bit was a bit like you ringing a bell. All right, so you have pain in your big toe and some kind of cord was stimulated, you know, a fibre. We still call, call nervous tissue fibres because of this kind of idea that it's like a fibre which goes all the way up to the brain and you can tug it and, it, and, a, and a bell rings in the pain centre of the brain and that tells you you've got pain. Okay? So people used to have this kind of like very rigid idea of that physiological aspect of pain, okay, that biological aspect. It still colours what we do today and it's wrong. Right. In reality, this is the hunchback of Notre Dame on the bell. All right? You've got loads of other things ringing that bell. Okay? Some of those other things occur because your nervous system isn't static, it's always changing. So I've been teaching you now for about six or seven minutes, and within that time, if you've learned something new, I've changed your brain. I've changed the physical structure of your brain. Because memory is caused by your neurons forming new connections. Okay, so if you learn something today, you, could, you, you know, I have changed, I've altered your brain. All right, that's what learning and education does. Okay, and it does it not just for knowledge, but it does it for everything else as well. So everything, every new experience you have changes your nervous system. Your nervous system is always in a state of plastic, plasticity. It is changing all the time. Okay. Um, the other thing we have, general health effects can affect pain. So people experience pain at times of stress, which they would normally ignore. Because when you're stressed, you get what we call a somatic focus. Think about this now. If you had an exam this afternoon, some of you would be complaining of stomach ache or headaches. All right? If I threw an exam, you know, have you been told by Leslie there's a test on this subject at two o'clock? Yeah? Look at panic in some of your eyes. All right? You start to feel physical, physical effects, if that was true. Yeah? You start to sweat. You start to, you know, your heart rate will go fast. You might get palpitations. That's the effect of stress. And some of those stressful effects produce, make you more aware of pains that you don't normally have. Okay? Um, and again, I've talked about that bit about pain arising from the nervous system, so I'm going to gloss over that. Okay? So a different way of thinking about pain is this idea of pain control theory. I'm not going to go into this a lot. We do some stuff on physiology uh, in the second year for adult nurses, and I think you do for children's nurses as well. But a gate control theory is a, is a way of helping us to understand the complexity of pain from a physiological perspective. It has this idea that there are different inputs coming in, which are pain signals, and these are modulated by inputs coming down. And the theoretical place where the gate can, this gate is is in your dorsal horn of your spinal cord, which is where your nervous system connects into your spinal cord. Okay? This is a, the um, a theoretical model which was, came, which was developed in the 1960s before we knew a lot about neurotransmitters. In fact, we hardly knew about any neurotransmitters then. Okay. We just knew about nicotine and adrenaline, really. Very few others. Our body produces its own painkillers, which we call endog endogenous opioid peptides. These are endogenous means made within yourself. Opioid means they're like morphine, and a peptide means it's a protein. So these are proteins your body produces which are like morphine. These weren't discovered until 10 years, 10 to 12 years after the gate control theory was theorized. 
and that explains a lot of things about gate control theory, we produce our own opioids. Okay? Um, and the interesting thing about opioids with pain um, is that the opioids are responsible for dealing with pain, they're also responsible for dealing with memory and dealing with things that make you happy. So anything that makes you happy produces endogenous opioid peptides. So happiness, pain and memory are all shaped by opioids. Okay? So that's an interesting physiological problem that adds to the thing of uh, the issues with pain. But anyway, the whole idea was coming from the brain, from the central nervous system, there were these descending mechanisms, but nobody really understood how that worked because there is no descending pathway coming from the brain down to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. It's what we call an afferent pathway, so it's only messages coming from outside going up. Okay? So, that, so they couldn't explain this, it was just a theoretical model. More recently, we're able to explain it because we're able to use things like um, PET scans. So this is an image of somebody with acute pain. All right? This is a, uh, so basically, this is a volunteer um, who uh, agreed to experience acute pain while their head was in a scanner. And they just looked at the parts of the brain which light up. Okay? So <coughs> this is the uh, forebrain here. Okay? Um, this is the cerebral cortex. This is the limbic area. This is the um, thalamus. Okay? Um, this is the amygdala. Right? Amygdala is important for memory and learning. The limbic region is important for emotions. The frontal lobe, this is where you put all these different things together and turn what are unpleasant stimuli, stimuli into an idea about what pain is. Um, this is where pain is located. The thalamus, this is why people used to think about this bell, because if you have a stroke in the thalamus and you survive, you're very unfortunate because you can end up with a condition called post-stroke central pain, where basically you feel like the whole of your body is on fire. Okay. So it's a very rare condition because most people who have a stroke in the thalamus die because okay, the thalamus is important for lots of other basic functions. But if you have a stroke in your thalamus and you survive, you end up with total body pain. All right, so that's why you used to think it was just a pain centre. Because um, they could only go by, these are the symptoms somebody had, let's have a look at their brain when they, they've died and see if the brain tells us something about their symptoms. So this is a more positive way of looking at things. And that's allowed us to come up with another theory, which is the body self neuromatrix, which basically just tells us that pain is very complex and lots of different things interact. I'm not going to go into this in any great detail. It's on the slides. If you're interested, you can read up on it. Okay, <coughs> okay so that's the physical side of things. We also have psychological aspects to think about. These include things like our past experiences of pain, um, our family, how we were brought up, how we learnt to deal with pain. Think about yourself as a child and how your mother responded to you when you were in pain. All right? Did she give you emotional love or tough love? Yeah? So you're all saying tough love. Okay? That's going to shape the way you respond to others in pain. Okay? So, you know, if you have a child and they fall over and break their leg, you're going to say, don't worry, you can hop, you've got another leg. <laughs> all right? Or are you somebody who gets all kutchy and, you know, did you get a lot of emotional s sort of investment in you when you had the pain? That's gonna, that, that is likely to shape the way you respond when you're in pain. Okay? <coughs> a lot of nurses were brought up by tough love mothers. All right? Based on just my experience of how people respond to that question I've asked you. All right? I there's no objective test on that. I haven't measured it. I'm, it's just my feeling. All right? Okay. But if that is true, think about what the impact that has on your patients. Oh, you're in pain, never mind. You've only had your appendix removed. <laughs> you know, you've had two legs amputated and all your ribs are broken. But don't worry, you'll get better. Right? Or if not, you'll die. So we don't have to worry about it. So, you know, upbringing, beliefs, OK? 
Okay? Beliefs shape the way you have to think about pain. We have to think about this in terms of um, a lot of major world religions view suffering as a positive thing. Suffering is a route to enlightenment. It's a, it's a route to getting closer to God. Okay? Uh, how you endure your suffering informs you know, your development as a person. And we have the same kind of narratives with people who survive cancer. We talk about cancer survivors. Yeah? So the suffering of that makes them a stronger person. Okay? We have to guard against those kind of things when we're dealing with people who are in pain. Because we don't want to colour our dealings of people who are in pain and need help by our beliefs, maybe you might hold, that suffering a little bit is good. Anybody here is physical, you know, fitness freak, you can see I am, all right? <laughs> you know, no pain, no gain, you hear that sort of thing, yeah? Well, you know, that's the wrong kind of philosophy to adopt, all right? But people have those beliefs, so we have to think about that. We have to guard against it, we have to think about, about these issues. They developed because in the past it was very hard to deal with pain. It's still very hard to deal with some types of pain now. Okay? Particularly if you just focus upon physical treatments for the pain. All right? Sometimes that's all people had was some psychological development of um, um, an inner strength to help them deal with their pain. Okay? Um, and also we have thoughts. Thought processes can make pain worse or better. You know, one of the things that we know helps deal with pain is, is cognitive behavioural therapy, which is about changing the way people think about things when they're in pain. Okay? So, you know, you can have destructive thought processes, ideas that if I've got chronic pain, anything I do is going to make the pain worse, and if the pain's getting worse, my body's getting worse, my condition's getting worse, therefore I won't do anything and I'm going to rest. That's a very destructive process in terms of pain because with chronic pain movement is part of the treatment it's part of helping you deal with the pain and improving your general fitness so that your chronic pain actually reduces okay, so if, you're, if you have a destructive thought that I should rest when I've got pain then that's going to make your chronic pain worse right, so some of these things you have to think about what is somebody's thought process and challenge them and then we have the social aspects of things we have cultural responses to pain. There have been some studies that have looked at how people from different cultures express pain. This doesn't mean that their pain is any worse or, or any better. These are just cultural aspects. Okay? So most of us in this room, we're Northern Europeans. We're meant to be Stoics. Yeah? We're meant to be, you know, we're, we're not meant to express pain. We're meant to have a stiff upper lip. You know, the British stiff upper lip. Yeah? and all Northern Europeans are meant to have this okay? and then if you're from the Mediterranean you're meant to be more expressive yeah? and loud and express these things okay? and those things are acceptable in those cultures the problem ha that occurs is when you get somebody from one culture living in an area where the other culture dominates okay? and then that can, be, that can lead to prejudice and stereotyping okay? So there are cultural things around the expression of pain. There's cultural things about the way you were brought up, the groupings that you're in, that have an influence on how pain is expressed. There's education. We know with chronic pain, for example, that if you're not well educated, you have more, you're more likely to have chronic pain than if you don't. So you're all now, okay, you think you're doing a nursing degree, but getting a degree reduces your risk of getting chronic pain. Serious. The evidence is all there. Graduates have a lower incidence of chronic pain than non-graduates. Okay? They have a lower risk for it. And the better educated you are, the lower your risk is. All right? It's because you're able to mobilise resources better to help you. So not only is doing this nursing degree going to get you a job, it's going to protect you against chronic pain. All right? See? We didn't tell you that when, when you came here, did you? But it's a benefit that you're going to have. That doesn't mean that some of you aren't going to get chronic pain, mind you, because nursing is an occupational risk group for pain, which is another social thing, your employment. Okay, there are certain groups which are more risky for pain. This is why you're taught to do manual handling. All right? You're actually taught to do manual handling not to stop you getting pain, but to stop you being able to sue your employer. 
Because right? mm -hmm. if you've been taught manual handling, you shouldn't have a back, get a bad back. And if you choose not to follow the instructions, that's your fault. All right? So, you know, but at least they're doing something about that. You know? They didn't when I was a GPS. Um, so, yeah, but for your generation, they do. Okay? So, these are things to think about. Okay? These are social aspects. I've only listed a few of them. There's loads of them. All right? So, this leaves us with this interacting dimension, which we call biopsychosocial aspects. And if we think about pain, these, are, these different layers all overlap. Okay? And a bit that's interesting is this bit in the middle. Okay? So, uh, all right, I've already talked a bit about the fact that most of you in this room don't have testicles, so you can't experience proper pain. All right? Okay? So, you know, your layer for that is going to be different to those of us who are lucky to have enough to have testicles. All right? Okay? Or unlucky. All right? So our experience of pain is going to be different to yours because we have that experience. Okay? I doubt most men have experienced that, haven't you? Yeah? So you know how bad I'm, what I'm talking about. All right? Then we've got psychological aspects of things, things like how you were brought up, your education, those kind of things. That might differ. Okay? Um, between people. It might be different <coughs> between people in the room. And then we have the social dimension. Okay? So these all overlap. In the middle, we have what we call total pain experience. This is what makes pain unique for each individual. Because each of these elements is going to overlap in a diff slightly different way. Okay? So now, how can we objectively measure something which is unique to that person? All right? We can't. We have to think about subjective measurements. Okay? So, definitions of pain. We have to bear all these things in mind when it comes down to assessing pain. We have to think pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. This is the International Association for the Study of Pain's definition of, of pain. Okay? It's talking about physical pain, but it's also talking about pain being something which is described in terms of physical pain even when there might not be a physical cause for the pain there in the first place. All right? You wouldn't say that about heart disease or cancer. You know, cancer is something that somebody feels that they have. Yeah? Uh, ca cancer is a, a, a genetic deficit in cells which multiply, or it's something that people describe in those terms. You wouldn't, would you? Okay? So pain is something different to these other physical problems. Okay? Um, this is another definition of pain, which makes communication fundamental to pain management. Pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever he or she says it does. Okay? <coughs> so the person who is an expert in pain is the patient, not the health professional. They're an expert in their own pain. Okay? I'm a, I was a clinical nurse specialist in pain. I've done my PhD. I did my master's in pain management. I've done my PhD in pain management. Okay? Um, so I'm a doctor in pain, but I'm not an expert. All right? Because this is the perspective I take. I know about pain, but I only know about my own pains. I'm only an expert in my own pains. I don't know about your pain. And that's the attitude you have to take. All right? So, pain is whatever the experience in person says it is, existing whenever he or she says it does. Okay? This requires you to do something quite dramatic, which is to trust your patient. And not only that, to believe your patient. All right? These can be challenging things, because some patients are more trustworthy and more believable than others. All right? Patients who have problems are ones where the nurses are less likely to give them credibility for being truthful. Patients who already have um, an opioid drug addiction, people who've got chronic pain, people who, who have got drink problems, people with learning disabilities, children, people with mental health issues. None of these people are believed when they tell you that they have pain. Okay? Because people say, it's not their pain, they just want it because they want some drugs. Yeah? They're just telling you they've got a lot of pain because they've got drugs. 
people whose way of dealing with pain is through humour you know they can't be in pain because they're laughing and joking these are things that you hear you have to guard against them because those are saying I don't believe that person that person is lying to me that person is not a credible witness to the problem that and they are the only person who can be the expert in that problem alright so what you're saying is I don't believe you when you don't un- when you don't accept somebody's self-report of pain okay that doesn't mean that you have to depend your, your treatment has to be based upon what they tell you you use your clinical judgment for your treatment but what it but what it does mean is that when somebody says you're in pain you respond to it appropriately and you agree with them that they're in pain you don't dismiss it okay? and this is a big problem that people seem to have okay? this is one of the problems that nurses have in the literature um, they don't believe patients when, the, when they say they're in pain yep. um, this might sound like a silly question but if say someone did have a drug, drug addiction yes. and you were aware of that addiction yeah. then say you kind of I don't think it's really right for you to say well I don't think you should have it so if you gave it to them yeah just based on what they've told you yeah. would you get in trouble for that no you, no okay. if somebody if somebody ha- um, <coughs> is an IV opioid abuser for example there's something physiological happens is their body stops producing its own endorphins and if they have pain their, o- their opioid abuse deals with that this is why when people stop taking it suddenly they do what they call going cold turkey they no longer have endorphins within their body to respond to things until the body starts to manufacture them again which can take a couple of weeks all right and these are important neurotransmitters for a whole range of functions okay um, so if somebody has a drug dependency they have t- a toleration to that drug you actually have to give them what they have for their drug dependency and more on top in order to deal with your pain and when somebody's in pain the issue you have to face is let's deal with their pain because their psychological problems are not going to be resolved by saying no to, some, to somebody when they've got pain those are long term issues that need to be dealt with yeah? through a whole range of, of measures okay? um, so when somebody presents to you in pain even though you know that history you say yes you're in pain and we're going to do something about it what you do about it will depend upon your, your diagnosis of what the best way of, t- of treating it is there's no way at all that you can get in trouble for giving someone painkillers. You shouldn't do. Okay. Yeah? All right? As long as they're, p- they're prescribed painkillers. Yeah, of course. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... So here are some examples of... of uh, <laughs> all right? I hear it was a difficult birth. Okay? These are examples of different types of pain. The other thing we have to think about with pain is we also use it as a descriptor of people. This is a polite version. You might want to say something other than neck there. Uh, This is someone telling you about all their pain problems. And often when somebody tells you about their pain problems, they get ignored because we don't like to hear people complaining. If you think about it, the fundamental greeting in most languages is, you know, how are you? How are you? Hello, how are you? How are you? You're not going to answer. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> yeah. All right. We say hello. How are you? And we expect the response to be I'm fine because we're not really interested in how you are. Okay. So when people start telling you how they are, we think what a pain in the neck, or some other part of your anatomy. All right. This is a problem that patients have, and now, as nurses, obviously, we should be interested in, in how people are because that's the area we're working in but often we are also shaped by this okay let me give you a very li- simple illustration all right i want you to imagine that you're shopping you're in the supermarket okay maybe i don't know you're about to go on a, on a afternoon shift okay and it's about 11 o'clock and you've got to get all this shopping uh, back to your home before you go to work. Okay, so it's 11 o'clock, you've almost done, just put the ice cream in, you turn in a corner, and there you see an old friend. Let's imagine now, okay, it's the person sitting next to you in this room, and we're talking about five years' time. 
And so they know you're a nurse, they know you're qualified, they know you're doing really well. You say, hello, I haven't seen you, you know, since you're qualified. How are you? And they start telling you about their bad back. Because <laughs> they know you're a nurse, you've got to be interested. And half an hour later, they're still telling you about their bad back and how nobody's interested in them. And, you know, their, their partner has left them. And, you know, an hour goes, you're starting to worry, I'm late for my shift, all my ice cream has melted. That froze, the frozen peas are starting to thaw out. Uh, you know, you've got children with you and they're playing up. Your partner has walked off and he's sitting in the car park, tooting his horn. All right, or she. All right. Um, you manage to get away. You're late for work. You get told off. All right. Um, next week, you go to the supermarket and there's your friend. They know, you see, that that's the day you go shopping. So they're there waiting for you. <laughs> All right? You see them, but they haven't seen you yet. What do you do? <laughs> sure. Because they're a pain in the neck. <laughs> All right? So, these are things we have to think about. This is normal way to respond to somebody when they're appealing for help. Is to say, I don't want to hear about your problems. I want to tell you all about mine. Yeah? Okay, so we have to guard against that. Okay? These are common examples. This is somebody with a fractured neck and femur. It's somebody who's had surgery, multiple surgery. <laughs> All right? You have to realize what is surgery? Surgery is um, something that is, um, you have allowed to be done to yourself, which, if it was down a dark alleyway, would be called grievous bloody harm or attempted murder. All right? It's a physical, serious physical assault on your body. All right? And it's going to leave you with pain. All right? So somebody, if you work in a surgical area, expect your patients to have pain. Why on earth do you have to wait for them to tell you they've got pain? You should be thinking, they've had half their guts removed. Yeah? They've had a, a, a bowel resection. All right? you know, they've had so many meters of gut removed uh, with a big laceration in the middle of their stuff. They should have pain. Why should I wait for them to tell me about their pain? Yeah? Think about it. It's obvious, isn't it? All right? Okay, so here's a pain score that tool, all right? Okay, I wouldn't recommend you use it like this, all right? This is a five parts pain saw, and the patient's being warned the surgery's going to be level three. Yeah? All right? So, but at least we'll use, we're doing some kind of assessment, I think. Yeah, that's going on here, all right? So I want us also to think about how people are before and after their pain. All right. So, I've only got um, nine more minutes with you, and I'm not going to get through everything on here. So, what's after this is a selection of different um, types of pain tools, and I'm going to go over the basic principles of these and leave them on here for you to have a look at. Okay. So, the one I'm going to look at first of all is this visual analog scale. All right. There are only two scales which are actually. Um, identified as being appropriate for research. They're validated tools. One of these is this visual analog scale and the other one is um, the McGill pain questionnaire which is on here as well which is more complex. All right? um, and I'll flip through them all now before we finish just to go through this. But I want you to think about this. So this scale is this is no pain at all and this is the worst pain you've ever experienced. Okay? And we have a hundred millimetre line. So I want you to imagine you've got that 100 millimetre line in front of you, okay? So remember I asked you earlier on um, about your pain? Yeah? yeah? Worst pain you've ever experienced and your last pain. So I want you to put down, just to think, where on that 100 millimetre line will it be? I'll make it easier for you, okay? Um, so this is a simple descriptive scale. This is a numerical rating scale. I heard somebody saying, I've missed out on a thing here because there should be zero. So zero is no pain. Ten is the worst pain you've ever experienced. All right? So, <coughs> can you please give a score to the worst pain you've ever experienced and your latest pain? All right, I'm going to ask for some volunteers, all right, to, to, to give me their results.
का यूज हो दिस इज दिस ऑल वे टू इन हेयर इज वी बोलिंग डाउन अ कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी ऑफ पेन टू समथिंग व्हिच इज जस्ट अबाउट इंटेंसिटी सो वी इग्नोरिंग एवरी अदर क्वालिटी टू डू विद द पेन वी जस्ट फोकस ऑन इंटेंसिटी सो दीस स्कोर्स शुड बी यूज्ड इन सिचुएशंस where you are concerned about intensity of pain not other aspects of the, of the pain right so something like post operatively you know what's the main cause of the pain you want to retire and reduce the pain so you can deal with things all right that's an illustration okay so um let's have some hands up for worst pains okay what scores i had, well, I had a kidney infection once okay it was, it was quite severe and they, i was in hospital for a week with it and they asked me how how Yeah. Back in, I'm going to get a 1 to 10 and I actually answer 12. Okay. 12. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you're not a rock goddess and the volume doesn't go up to um 11. 10. All right. So 10. <laughs> All right, fine. Okay. And what's the latest pain? Oh. After that. Mm. No, the, the, the last one you had. No, the last one you had. Oh, probably like a headache. Okay, and where would you put that? 3. 3. Okay, fine. So, can we have another Well, yeah. Uh, the worst thing I ever felt was um, in my back garden. There's a, an open uh, hole that the washing line goes in, and it's yeah. kind of washing line. And it's just like if you can imagine a scaffold hole in the ground. Yeah. There's you know, a hollow yeah. metal ring. I ran across it in barefoot, and obviously, I can even run body weight. You know, yeah. it's triple on you, and it just went straight through my heel. Right. And like lacerate, like cut it all over. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that was just agony. It and was just Okay. I probably I'd be reluctant to tell. I know it's relative, but it was the worst pain I've ever felt, but I'd probably say that there are, are things that I would ex So what could give us a score? Or well, I give a 9. A 9. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I broke both my feet. Right. And um, I'd say I'd give it an 8. An 8. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Um I snapped the two bones in my arm and locked my wrist like that. Yeah. And uh, I'd give up like a nice turn it was it was agony. Okay. So no break, yeah. And this case shoulder. This case shoulder, yeah. And I. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Chamber. Oh, chamber. 10. 10. Uh, sort of <laughs> bad. <laughs> Go on. 10, all right. Yeah. So burns your arm, yeah. Seven point five. Okay. Now, so right, I've only got one honest person in this room. All right, which is the one who's a child above ten. I ask you what the worst pain you've ever experienced <coughs> is. It should be ten. That is the worst pain you've ever experienced. So any pain you've got at the moment, you're comparing to that. Now, if the pain you've got at this moment in time is worse than that. your new pain score is 10 and that will go down on that list yeah so you're 12 that was a 10 yeah. right okay you're that rare person who exaggerates right i don't need you in the supermarket okay you were reluctant to give it a 10 yeah, but you give it a 10 like, i feel like i wasn't deserving of a 10 like i feel like, yeah. <laughs> like you know something terrible in your past <laughs> life and you don't deserve a 10 i just feel like saying that like Well, um, um, it's a ten. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, you, you were imagining that you could have the worst pain, but I didn't ask you what the worst pain imaginable would be. A lot of us could imagine something worse than we've already had. Yeah. It doesn't operate like that. It's the worst pain you've ever experienced. Yeah. So you got yeah, so you got chronic pain. I couldn't say I'm in that situation. I couldn't say no. Okay, do you have flare-ups? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay, so you're but you're so chronic. I'm talking really about acute pains, which are. You know, you're relying upon memory. You're living an experience of pain, um, and it goes up. I imagine your pain goes up and down depending on a, a variety of things. Yeah. So, 
<laughs> this is another problem, you see, where you stay on all the time and we just focus on intensity and we don't look at other things. And really, if you've got chronic pain, you shouldn't really be interested in intensity scales. You should be interested in what can you do. Because if you can function, all right, and you obviously can because you're here and you're doing a course, then really, does it matter? You know, what, how, intensity, how intense it is, how we compare you. Because the danger people are doing is they're using these intensity scores to compare pain to each other. How can you compare a burn where somebody has degloved their skin, all right, to childbirth, to a laceration on the heel, yeah, um, to um, a kidney infection? You can't, all right? This is the problem. People use scales to make comparisons between patients, and you shouldn't. The way the intensity scales should be made is to measure the quality of the care that you're giving somebody. So, if somebody has a score of 10, and you intervene, their score should be reduced by half for you to know that you've given them good quality treatment. So, their score should go down to 5. Yeah? If somebody has a score of 7, it should go down to 3.5. You're not going to totally relieve it. It's unreasonable to say you're going to do pain relief. This is why I prefer the term pain management. It's very hard to get people's pain down to zero. Okay? Um, but we're looking at reducing an intervention. Yeah. And so what you do is you use the same scale on the same person and you compare what they were before to what they were after when you've done something to relieve their pain. And you should be aiming for a 50% reduction. Yeah? If you've got a patient that doesn't speak English, yes. um, then there's the communication barrier. Yes. How would you um, ask them their pain? Like okay. Their if they can, if they can write, read and write, there are pain scales done in multiple languages. On the British Pain Society web page, they've got about 25 of the most common languages that are used in the in, um, UK. They've even got it in Welsh. And are they in um, they should be, they might not be. This is one of the problems, one of the barriers to pain assessment is are these tools available? But they are available on the internet for you to use. Yeah? So they are out there. Okay. So we're going to have to finish there. I'm just going to quickly go over the other scales just to show you. All right. These are faces scales which are quite clearly used with children. There are problems with these scales. I don't have time to go over what the problems are. That's another one which is used for children. This is one where you're introducing play. It's a different kind of scale. You use this. You've got to make sure you give a, um, a gender appropriate one. You don't want to give a boy this one because they'd sulk. <laughs> All right. And vice versa. This is looking at the nurse trying to objectively measure in a neonate. This is that McGill pain questionnaire I told you about, which is more appropriate for people with chronic pain. Um, and here's just some key points to go over. I want you to think about this. Patient's the only one who knows their pain. We can guess, but ultimately we must rely upon subjective judgment. It's the patient's view. That really means we have to trust the patient and believe them. We can use pain assessment tools. <coughs> to get some kind of grasp on something which is complex and that involves the patient in their evaluation because you're asking them and you're trying to put it against a scale but an assessment tool does not measure anything to do about the patient it's not there to judge the patient an assessment tool gives the patient an opportunity to judge your quality of care that you're giving them because if you're saying to them my pain is 10 out of 10 and they've been in your care for more than an hour and it's still 10 out of 10, then I would suggest to you that your nursing care needs to be closely examined because it's probably not up to scratch. All right? So I'm going to leave on that note. Okay? So nice to meet you all. And we're, I'm sure we're going to see each other like, um, at some other time. It will be. Sorry, we're just recording it.